guess I'll kick it off with just a, a quick intro of our guest today. So Gloria Zhao is uh, a huge part of the blockchain at Berkeley family. She, uh, she started in the club before my time, but, uh, and Gloria, I'll let you fill in a bit too. I don't want to take your whole story away from you, but she started out in the education department, um, actually doing a lot of work on the, the decal or the course that is now a webinar that uh, hopefully all of you are also following. Otherwise, I don't really know how you got this link. Um, but a lot of the content that uh, we're sharing with you is, was developed by Gloria here, uh, at least in part. Um, she even went on uh, later to become the president of Blockchain at Berkeley, and uh, I think the club is only only merited from that. Uh, she brought so much energy to the position, so much effort, and uh, so many new opportunities to the club. The education department has uh, certainly grown since then, um, and I think the consulting department is doing no worse for the wear. That's also true. <laughs> but since then, of course, now Gloria is... Uh, uh, getting ready to to enter the working world, she's uh, she's you know held down some some internships in Sui. She's held down some work in the crypto space too, and now what is on the horizon is actually contributing to Bitcoin Core. So the very technology that we have kicked off the webinar learning about, Gloria is actually developing as we speak. Uh, so we'll definitely get into that and what the career space looks like in, in crypto as well. Um, but we'll let that, that happen on its own. Uh, so I guess without further ado, Gloria, if there's anything I missed, anything you wanna fill in, uh, please feel free to do so. Or if you wanna give us maybe a little bit more, more background and kind of give us like, like your whole story in blockchain too, I think that'd be a great way to start. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Andrew. It uh, makes me very happy to hear all these great things. Um, yeah, I grew up in Silicon Valley. I'm from South Bay, Cupertino anyone's heard of that and I mean like Andrew makes me sound like really cool but I actually got into Washington at Berkeley because it was the only club that I could get into like I applied everywhere and I like wasn't cool enough to get into any clubs but Washington at Berkeley was taking everyone in 2016 2017 <laughs> so that's how I got in um, and actually I started as uh, in consulting actually as a business consultant um, and it, it like took me such a long time to figure out Bitcoin is like I thought mining was expensive because you needed like special hardware to like mine a special ore out of rocks to like turn into Bitcoin or something. I don't know. I just like I took me a long time. I'm not I wasn't very smart. Um, but yeah, and then I started teaching the decal and I'm not the best public speaker. So they were like, oh, you need to read some like cypherpunk manifesto, like read digital gold and less some Julian Assange and shit. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Like kind of makes sense. Like it makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, most of my most of my time in Washington Berkeley was teaching the decal and like doing president stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, like for the past six months ish, I've been contributing to Bitcoin Core, and I think it's like the only meaningful thing I've done in my life. Like, like I like I I can't remember what held my life together before like six months ago but yeah I'm, it's like my whole life is centered around this this oh, it sounds like I'm in like a cult but you know it's it means a lot to me and I'm really grateful that I found this so early in my life so yeah well hopefully uh before Bitcoin core back when you were still president of BAB I, I can only assume it meant something to you given the amount of work that you put in yeah yeah i mean okay so like when i joined it was 2017 and then oh in the zoom oh i think i don't think dave is good uh liam or someone if you can send dave the link um what was i saying yeah when i first joined blockchain Break, like you know not many people understood what it was and then I think because the number of applicants we get to blockchain at Berkeley, at least when I was president, like very tightly correlates with what the price of Bitcoin is. So when it like skyrocketed towards the end of 2017 and beginning 2018, like everyone was like interested, you know, maybe, maybe not like intellectually, but at least like want to know what it's about. And then when crypto winter hit, like everybody left. Like, I don't know, it was 
piss me off. You know, I was like, I thought we were a family. Like I thought we were here for, to be sucker punks and like fuck shit up. But you know, most people left and, and I get it. You know, it's like all of my friends were like, why are you still doing blockchain? Like, isn't that like a thing in the past? Like it's nobody cares about that shit anymore. And now you got to work on like self-driving cars and ML and stuff. It's like very trendy. It's Silicon Valley, right? Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I ended up as president. And, you know, I cared about it a lot. And then I mean, I guess, I mean, now I, I think we're like kind of cool or I don't know, like we're still relevant um, and I'll take some credit slash blame for that because like very much what we had to do was like rebrand and like kind of embrace the new industry like trends. So, you know, we, we did consulting, we like ghost wrote white papers, we like, you know, did meetups for like every shit coin that wanted to do one with us because, you know, we wanted to stay relevant and not die. Um, I, I mean, that sounds super negative, but, you know, we were doing cool things and, you know, like we had an education program. Everyone would come into blockchain at Berkeley. They would learn like software engineering. They'd get to work with clients in a consulting project. Um, and then at the end of the semester, you know, you give them a Patagonia, you ship them off to Barcelona, you rent out a beach house and a yacht and you party it up. And like, that's what, that's what people want in college. I think is like a good resume to graduate, get a job, look good on Instagram and LinkedIn and all that stuff. It's all, it all, it, make, it makes sense to me. Like I, I definitely get that. But then I think like about a year ago, like, and this is like two year, two, three years into my Bitcoin, into my blockchain journey. I'm looking around, it's like, nobody's, nobody's using Bitcoin. Like nobody's ever sent a Bitcoin transaction. Um, I got a client email me and he was like, oh, like, I, I, you got to read this article. It says that because blockchain is not scalable, we're moving away from blockchain and towards distributed ledger technologies. Do anything about that? And I'm like, uh, like, I sit there for like a few minutes, just like fuming. And then I like email him back. And I'm like, with all due respect, sir, that is a another buzzword for the same fucking thing to fool people like you in Silicon Valley who need to feel like we're innovating every three months for like a, some kind of dopamine hit or something. I don't know. It just pissed me off. And, you know, I, I've been thinking and I'm like, okay, it's been like two, three years now. And every year there'll be like state of the ledger 2018 or whatever. This is the year that we're going to like move away from POCs. We're going to actually pilot stuff. All these companies that raise like hundreds of millions of dollars in their ICOs, they're finally going to like produce the product that they promised to produce. And like never happens. They just like come up with new ways to like scam money out of people. Um, and, you know, and this is all like blockchain. It's, it's Silicon Valley. It's, it's not like, it's not like specific to blockchain is what I'm saying. It's just, you know, that's, that's how things are when, when you monetize things and when things get popular. Um, but you know, I was like, you know, fuck this. Like I'm, I'm going to get out of blockchain and I'm going to come back to into blockchain obviously later. But you know, at this point in my journey, I was very, very jaded, very like very much done. I like lined up the Google, Facebook, you know, Amazon internships. And I was like, I'm gonna like clean out my resume of everything blockchain related and replace it with like legitimate suite, which um is a whole other topic. But I did this and I was done. You know, I still loved Washington Outbreak. I love every single person in it. And like, you know, they're my family, my baddies, whatever. Um, but I was, I was done with Washington. I didn't want to do it anymore. And then I got a email from Jonas, Adam Jonas at Chaincode. And he's like, hey, Gloria, like you applied to the Chaincode residency last year. Like, why don't you apply again? You're really close. I'll also, be not can we get some really quick context on what yeah. the chain code residency oh, is. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Know. Okay, yeah. So chain code is a um, kind of like a company. It's a company founded by some very rich people, and basically what they focus on is Bitcoin core research and development, or you know, Bitcoin related. Um, so I would say it's like the holy grail of places to work in Bitcoin development, but I don't want to. Uh, name of the club it's chain code labs it's it's a company um not a club but they they sponsor a lot of developers to work on bitcoin core and or do research on bitcoin 
be it like P2P or, you know, distributed systems and stuff like that. Um, but every year they do this residency, which is, thank you, Andrew, which is um, a place for people to learn about protocol development, uh, Bitcoin, Lightning, all that stuff. And I would say like a, a good portion of current Bitcoin core developers and like relevant um, contributors in this space come out of this residency. So it's, it's very, very valuable and a lot of mentorship happens there, which is extremely important to the industry. Um, so anyway, that, that's the context for the residency. And so I applied and then, and then he's like, do you want to apply again? I'm like, nah, nah, like I'm good. You know, I'm just, I want my grandma to know the name of the company that I work at, you know, like I want my parents to be proud of me. Like I want to be cool <laughs> with my friends again, you know, like, um, and then, and then he's like, Oh, you know, it's just like, you know, if I have, there's some Bitcoiners going to Stanford blockchain conference. So if you want to meet them, I'd be like, Oh, I'm not going to say no. Like it's not very often that you get to meet someone who works on Bitcoin core, but in my head, I'm like imagining these like nutty, like carnivore, narrow-minded redneck like bitcoin maximalists who are going to be like really rude to me but i'm like i can take it you know i've, I've talked to plenty of people and then i meet them and it's uh john newberry and amelia tarwar and they're like yeah we work on bitcoin core uh, and and john says in his like very nice voice he's like oh and i'm so lucky that i work on the most interesting project in the world and i'm like like i pause because i'm like expecting him to like explain why he said that because, like, you know, you can't get away with saying, like, such nice things about Bitcoin in Silicon Valley, right? And I'm like, oh, I imagine you have to, like, defend yourself all the time. It's like, what do you, what do you say? And people, like, attack you. He's like, well, no, I don't have to, to defend myself very often. I'm like, okay, like, this is my chance. Because this is the first time I've been at a conference where someone, like, technically knows what they're talking about. And, like believes in Bitcoin. It's, it's not very common in, in Silicon Valley for someone to, to be uh, in, to have that opinion. So I proceed to like pick their brains for like the next three hours. I ask them like every question I've ever had about like deflationary monetary policy and decentralized governance and like miners versus devs, like, you know, block size and you know, everything. Uh, oh, environmentally friendliness stuff, everything. Right. And then, and then like, I'm like, Oh shit. Like this is the first time like something like this has happened. And then and I'm like, oh, everything I thought about Bitcoin is like kind of wrong, you know? And then Amidi goes like, well, why don't you just like build the code? Like just like clone the repo and, and fit, like watch it for your, or like, you know, like, like look at the code, like run the test. Like, I'm like, you can do that? I'm like what? And she's like, yeah, you know, it's just a few commands and you have a node running. I'm like, oh, oh hold up there. I've worked at these, I've worked at companies where, you know, we run nodes and it's not easy, you know? So, I mean, not that the companies I worked with weren't building like very interesting things, but you know, running a node is not always, it, like, it sounds like you would just install something and then double click it and it starts running. Um, but that, it, you know, I, in my experience, it hasn't been that easy, especially if you're like running on testnet and you're playing with, you know, adversarial environments, you're constantly upgrading your software and everything. Um, it, you know, it has to run on different machines and, you know, usually we get it running for like, you know, the typical like AWS Linux, like, uh, you know, VM. And then so I'm like, okay, okay, I'm sorry. And then I'll, I like allocated a whole weekend to do it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try to do this for eight hours. If it doesn't work, I'll just, you know, I'll go back, I'll go back to, you know, I do Google and Facebook and all those things. But just it's like my last shot at like Bitcoin and blockchain because fundamentally, like you know, I read all of that Julian Assange and like cypherpunk stuff. I didn't do it for nothing. Like it, it still makes sense to me. Um, and then so I like clone the repo, Bitcoin slash Bitcoin, and I'm like, all right, configure, auto gen, okay, uh, make, and then you know it just sits there running for like 30 minutes, and then it compiles, and I'm like. Oh, that worked. Okay, uh, Bitcoin D, and then it's and then it's like downloading blocks, and I'm like, what? <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> but anyway, like I think um, I, I know it sounds like I was I was hating on blockchain a lot, and you know, with any uh, like I said, like with any industry, 
there's there's going to be people who are here for the money instead of the things that you believe in um but yeah like since since that fateful day on which i figured out that you can get a bitcoin road running built from source in, in four lines four commands i have uh i've been back in the rabbit hole and falling very quickly very hard um it's like being in love you know it's like slowly then all at once <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm definitely glad to hear that you're back into blockchain because I know you're an incredible asset, at least just like to have conversations with back when you were still so in nice. the <laughs> But if I, uh, could I do like a, a real quick recap on your story? And then I want to pick out a couple of parts that I want to dive a little deeper on. So yeah. this is in no way meant to be like reductionist, but uh, it seems like at a high level, you know, you started out in blockchain, you were just like applying to clubs, you made it in. Um, you started out as a biz consultant and I might want to ask you about that a little bit later on, but there was mm -hmm. something that caught my ear. You're talking about your transition into the education department and how, uh, you know, you were a little bit worried about your ability to present on this. And mm -hmm. it's interesting to me that the advice that you got wasn't to just practice or just like rehearse the lectures or generally just try public speaking more. Mm -hmm. the the advice that you got was instead you should go back to the basics you should understand like why people love this technology why they're so into it and why it was originally created mm -hmm. and that should give you at least like the the motivation to present on this and to do it justice mm -hmm. um and uh, first of all i think that's an uncommon approach that's not always the advice i get um but uh i'd like to i'd like to just hear what that experience was like for you so learning about the ideological motivations. You mentioned a couple pieces of literature, the cypherpunk manifesto, Julian Assange's work. So could you give us just like a, a quick boil down, like what is in your words, the ideology um, that spawned Bitcoin, or at least the ideology that after reading all of these texts, like you found yourself subscribing to and, and yeah, like why does Bitcoin matter? You know? Yeah, well, I don't want to speak on behalf of like all cypherpunks or Satoshi or whatever, but I mean, everyone kind of has gripes with like the system and the game and of life that they live in. Um, mine is my personally is very much like I grew up in Silicon Valley, like everyone is just a piece of paper or, you know, it always just feels like I'm doing this thing so that I can put it on my resume or like I'm trying to like take this class and get a good grade so that I can get into this club so that it can give me a referral to this internship so that I can like do two interviews instead of seven for the full time offer and so that I can work at this company that you know like has a nice logo or whatever. Um, and like everything is so like paper, you know, like I'm this piece of paper, like, I don't know, I like grew up in, in Cupertino, like all you do is like SAT, you have to take more SAT, uh, AP tests and, you know, and for, for no reason, you know, like the, the why is because my parents said so, or why do I want to go to school? Because it's on the ranking. Why do I want to do this? Oh, I don't know, because like, it'll make me happy or whatever. And so for me, that why component is extremely important to me because I know what it's like to like, I can stay up all night. I, I can pull like five all nighters in a row. Like I can, like, we all know how to hustle. We go to Berkeley, we study CS and whatnot, but like not having that why piece, it just feels like you're running on this like hamster wheel of life of like, you're running as fast as you can, but you're not getting anywhere. You're not getting happier. The world's not getting a, it's not becoming a better place. Um, and, and, and so like, I think it's similar in that with money, like when your money system is broken, um, for for you personally, like w w for at some point, like WikiLeaks could not accept anything other than Bitcoin as donations because they were being financially censored. Their bank accounts would be closed. Um, so it, it's all it's very fundamentally tied to your freedom and your your freedom of speech, which is what WikiLeaks is all about um your freedom to operate and all that stuff and 
right now, like, okay, here's like, here's like an anecdote, right? So I got my federal tax return over the summer. It was like, a, let's say like, it was like literally like $8, okay? <laughs> so I got this check from the US Treasury and it's like, here's a check for $8 payable to Gloria Zhao, right? And I'm like, okay, let's break this down. Let's, let's say exactly what this is, right? This check is a promise from my, my government that I can deposit $8 into my bank account. My deposit at the bank account is a promise from the bank and from the FDIC that they'll insure it. And just in case it doesn't work out that I can withdraw $8 worth of US dollars cash from the bank. Those $8 in US cash is a promise from the same government agency that gave me this check that I'll be able to buy things with it. Right. And, and then you're going to say like, Oh, but it's the U S government. Like, you know, it's been stable. It's been working all these years. Um, and with the political climate and whatnot, I mean, regardless of what your political leanings are, like, actually, I don't want to speak on, uh, on behalf of everyone, but like, there's a lot of trust in just this piece of the check that they gave me. It's like, I'm trusting them to, to do everything, basically. It all like boils down to trust. And, and I don't, I don't appreciate that. And they've, very frequently broken that trust um just by like and you say like oh they need to print money so that there's elasticity and you know inflation is good because you gotta, it's like natural it's like that's how money works oh like you, you want to invest your money in risky like investments rather than letting it sit in under your mattress because it's just how money works um it's not I mean, I, I can't pretend to say like, I know exactly how money works, but I don't like the idea of like, if you can print money for inflation or for elasticity and to like stimulate the economy or whatever, you can also print money to fund wars that I never agreed to. You can print money to um, just like make my dollar worth less and your, yours worth more because you're the one with the printer. Um, and these are people and bureaucratic institutions that we're giving this power to not like some algorithm or like benevolent angel sent down to earth to like help us all like this is not this is people we're talking about right um and i think that's that's what that's what it's about is like no i i want to have a say in how my money works and and i want to be protected from people like that um and that, that's what Bitcoin is, is it's, it's, it's not, it's not number go up. It's not like a stock that you buy that's going to, so that you can like exchange it for more US dollars later. It's a private transaction method that allows you to not be traced. Um, hopefully yeah, I've answered your question. Can I ask question. actually to elaborate <laughs> a bit on, um, so, so that privacy bit, if I, if I understand correctly, I mean, I did take mm -hmm. the, uh, the fundamentals course way back. I know that's a that's a core tenet for the cypherpunks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a big part of their thesis is that privacy is incredibly important, especially yeah. now. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering if we could hear in your words, like, why privacy, right? Like, why is that so important? And why is it becoming more and more important, you know, as time goes on today? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. So there's, I, I think I want to talk about two different things. One is like privacy in general. I, I think people tend to take privacy for granted for one, and also don't really have a proper mental model about what privacy is. Like, first of all, privacy is often a crucial component of security, right? Like if you know the topology of the network, you're able to um, partition it easier. If you know more information about um, a person, you're able to attack them better, right? Like phishing scams and all of that. Um, and like, so when we think about privacy, we shouldn't think of it as like, oh, like, do I care if someone like knows information? Like, you know, it's not like, oh, either my nudes are being leaked on the internet or X, Y, Z, I don't know. But we can talk about that later. But what people usually want to talk about is like personal privacy. So like, do I care? Do I use incognito mode? Do I care if like, my money is anonymous or whatever. And there's this meme that I really, really hate. Um, 
I really, you already know which meme this is. It's, it's the one where it's like, ha ha ha, the FBI agent like assigned to watch me through my webcam must be so disappointed that all I do is binge watch Netflix, ha ha ha. Um, and, and the reason that I say that it's stupid is, you know, there's no FBI agent watching you, not because like the government isn't surveilling you, but because they don't need a person to watch you. A computer can watch everyone at once and come up with an idea of like how to control you like that, okay? Like if you study computer science, like you know how it works, right? Like Facebook has an entire profile on you, your pictures and your friends and who you talk to and what you say to them, right? Google like knows where you've been every minute of the day for the past, like however many years you've had a Google account or like a Google device. Amazon knows what you like to buy. If you're stupid enough, it has a device in your living room that like listens to everything that you say and knows exactly like when it gets a head start on it gets a heads up whenever you're like, oh, I want to buy this thing. And they're like, all right, let's send, let's figure out the ad to send them. And they'll put it in their, your email inbox, you know, like, and people are always like, oh, it's not that bad, you know, but like there, first of all, today, these companies on like their entire profit model hinges on not just ads, but targeted ads. You know, like ads don't make that much money. It's the fact that they have so much information about you and they know exactly what to feed you, right? Like what political like videos to send you, like, like Instagram knows my bra size somehow. Like it specifically targets like small itty bitty titty committee like bras at me because it knows my bra size. Well, it knows I'm a girl, first of all, right? Like it already has quite a bit of information about me. Their entire profit model is based on them collecting information about me. And like, these are hundred billion dollar companies, right? So like you tell me if, if your privacy is like valuable to you or to other people or not, right? And like, it, it can only get worse from here, you know? Like as techniques for artificial intelligence get smarter and, you know, as technology gets better, whatever, like, either you as a computer science student choose to use it in a way for these companies to make more money or to restrict more freedom, or you use it to say like, fuck you, I'm going to go build things like Bitcoin and, you know, work on everything open source and like decentralize the world. Like that's your choice. Right. But like as a personal, like I just deleted my Facebook because what does it do other than have information about me? Um, like you as an informed consumer or a not informed consumer, like you make your decision, right? Um, but you know, for me, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested. I gotcha. Yeah. yeah, me neither. So, so basically, the cypherpunk's whole thing with privacy is that, you know, as we're like, especially given how digitally connected we are today, right? You mentioned things like Facebook, Amazon. They know what you like to buy. They know who you like to talk to. Um, and right now that might seem benign to us, but as long as we don't care about privacy and our data is easy to acquire, it will only exceedingly so be monetized or weaponized against us. Is that like a good sort of takeaway yeah. of the cypherpunk vision? Yeah, yeah. They're like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> and so I'm interested in specifically, like to myself at, at a high level, um, it totally makes sense that, yeah, like if my privacy is out there in the world, uh, it could be monetized against me. And the Facebook example is the first thing that would come to my mind too. Like Facebook knows about me. They can send me all the ads that I want. Um, but I'm a little more interested, like why should privacy in transactions matter, right? Like uh, mm. I guess at the end of the day, if if the bank were to send Facebook like, here's exactly where he spent his money all the time. Like that would be pretty mm -hmm. useful data, but it's definitely like down, down there on the list of uh, things that I don't want shared about me. Like that's not the first thing that comes to mind. The first thing that comes mm -hmm. to mind, like you said, is like, oh, I want to keep like five nudes or something. I want to keep that private. If <laughs> I have like private keys, if I have sensitive information, I want to keep that private. Mm -hmm. But uh, what is it about transactions, right? Like, why is it so important that we keep our, our transactions and our money uh, private as well? Yeah, uh, so two pieces again, like the first, the first aspect I always want to talk about is the security aspect. Um, like, secure, or anonymity or privacy or whatever is a very core 
principle for fungibility. Um, so for example, if you're, okay, so if you have like a dollar bill that has like Coke on it or like, you know, some other like illicit substance covering it um, versus like a freshly minted, like from the printer, like dollar bill, um, those two are still worth the same because you can always take the Coke covered one to the bank and be like, hey, can you shred this and like give me a new one, right? Um, but if it were the case where, you know, of course, Bitcoin transactions are all like the, the, the history is all available. Like if you were able to say like, oh, that one was used in, in Silk Road transactions. Um, this has been transacted with a known like criminal's address um, that if that Bitcoin is worth less than a Bitcoin that was freshly mined, um, that's that's a problem. Fungibility is a is a property that we care about for money. Um, and then in terms of like personal privacy, um, of course, like let's say you buy like a Pornhub video or like anything that is like less than ideal citizen kind of stuff. Like if you buy weed for which is like now legal in California, but you know, let's say, you know, your your parents or like you're originally from like some some place where it's not legal, or like, you know, there's there's different nuances in terms of like what's legal or what's controversial or whatever, um, and you can say like, oh, but I'm like a good citizen, like I have nothing to hide, um, but that changes the definition of a good citizen changes the more power your government has, like the more totalitarian or authoritarian your government is, like the less you are able to do as a quote unquote good citizen, right? Um, and, and like freedom of speech or freedom of whatever, like you're like, oh, I'm not the one posting on WikiLeaks or like, oh, WikiLeaks has a bunch of like criminal stuff on there. But like you, your right to freedom of speech also includes your right to hear what people like Edward Snowden and like others on WikiLeaks have to say about your government. Like if your government is doing something kind of shady, like I would want to know. I don't know about you, but I feel like it is my right to know that piece of information. Um, and so like if you are in China right now, for example, and they're kind of like piloting this new like digital currency where you can use like your WeChat app, whatever, to like transact and use this money, like, let's say you're born today and your entire life you spend using this digital currency in China and it has your entire transaction history on it and your government can see, you know, what amount and who you transacted with. Like, that is really, really scary to me, especially now that like China also has like facial recognition and they have like the social credit stuff. And then like, it's just like uh, that Black Mirror episode, Nosedive, where like what you can do in society, like, and that one sucked because they had to like look good on Instagram and stuff. But like, like I said, the more, you know, control your government has over you, the, the smaller that scope of like what you're allowed to do as like a quote unquote good citizen, right? Um, just well, I'd like to see. push back on that really quick in the mm -hmm. most naive way, right? Um, so I'm with you. Uh, I would say, like, assuming the government was very totalitarian and also, like, with clear malintent. Um, yeah, obviously, I don't want the government seeing all of my transactions uh, if I know that they're just going to try to, like, weaponize this against me or constrain me in some way. Um, but let's take uh, a look at, like, another situation where you know, maybe we've got like a, a really benevolent government, one that we really trust. Now having this sort of visibility uh, into the transactions of its citizens may allow it to prevent, uh, you know, things we consider illicit. And you did point out that that definition is changing all the time, what we consider to be mm. legal, unethical, controversial. But while those definitions do stand on the day to day, it is kind of nice to be able to prevent that activity. So do you have any thoughts on like, you know, should we switch over to a fully decentralized payment system, we can no longer, you know, censor WikiLeaks and, and we can no longer like target people based on their transaction history. We can also no longer prevent criminals from, from transacting with other criminals. Um, and I guess, where do you see the, the role or the responsibility of Bitcoin and its devs in that? Is it on the, on the job of the devs to try to 
make the system work so that we can prevent unethical behavior or, or is that just completely decoupled from the technology you know what i mean yeah uh th yeah there's this like I, this kind of gets into philosophical stuff but it's like oh you know if if you know someone is tracking everything like it helps us catch bad guys too because bad guys if we can use this technology for good then bad guys can also use it to do more bad stuff um but like who decides like what is good or bad again like that it comes back to that piece of like okay who's surveilling like who's deciding like who can do yes or no like like who is using this right and like and, and people say this too we're like oh should the atomic bomb have been invented because you know that's probably like there's it's not like that's the most like black and white like this is clearly like not it's not going to help anyone to be able to atomic like build atomic bombs but like if technology exists if it's within the realms of possibilities for human discovery to reach like it exists and you can't say like oh the government has made bitcoin illegal or like it has made atomic bombs illegal and then it's like the bad guys are going to be like oh Oh shit, guys! We can't we can't use atomic but we can't use Bitcoin anymore because the government said we can't. Like that's that's not what like that it doesn't work that way, right? Um, but then like okay, assuming that technology exists, and I personally don't believe that technology is good or evil. Um, although the atomic bomb, you know, it's like it's very easy to argue that it is purely evil. But you know, like it's just knowledge, right? But anyway, given that it exists and it is out there and somebody knows about it, maybe we as technology knowers or people who are, you know, are knowledgeable about this should try to use it for good instead of relying on someone to decide who should use it. And, you know, like in this case, and hopefully this was made clear before, your government is the bad guy that you are trying to protect yourself from. It is not the benevolent whatever that's protecting you from other bad guys. Um, and then and the other piece that you talked about was like, if, is it the responsibility of devs um, and people who are aware of this technology to, to decide? Well, they don't just get to decide, but you know, um, individually you and me we were like okay i learned about cryptography now i'm going to use it to like end to end encrypt my own conversation so that the government can't read it um and then hopefully we don't do anything like illegal whatever that means um but yeah I don't, I, I don't think it's something that anyone should decide um not the devs not the government but we as individuals get to so i, I don't know if that answers the question but that does. I see where you're coming yeah. from. So basically, like, let's like say Bitcoin exists, right? Uh, even if the government were to adopt it, uh, there's nothing they could do to prevent criminals from using it. And if the government were to not adopt it, there's still nothing we can do to prevent criminals from using it. So we might as well adopt it as a community and, and make use of the benefits um, and just deal with the fact that, you know, those criminals would have been using it anyway, right? technology yeah. force of nature yeah and, and like privacy and like a uh, sound money like privileged people and rich people can always afford it like we're from i'm from california you're from new york like i'm pretty sure the u.s dollar has worked perfectly fine for us so far i've never been financially censored uh, banks have not declined my applications to get a credit card you know it's never happened to me before and, you know, the U.S. dollar is stable, I can exchange it for currencies when I travel and like, you know, have quite good purchasing power. And that's not the case everywhere, you know, like Bitcoin is often more adopted in more, you know, developing countries because their own currency is not as stable as Bitcoin or not as trustworthy as Bitcoin. Um, and, and so like, it always works for like people like us who are extremely privileged and can afford the best option, but like given that this technology is available, we should open source it. We should make it an option for every single person in the world to have it by default, right? Stability and privacy, it should, sovereignty, it should be the default, um, or it should be an option that is accessible to everyone, regardless of where they're born. I like that, yeah.
And I guess I want to uh, step away from sort of like the ideological uh, motivations for, for Bitcoin. I think uh, I'm feeling pretty refreshed on, you know, why privacy, right? Like, why does that matter, mm -hmm. especially in transactions? Um, but I want to sort of dive into, into the Bitcoiners world a bit more, right? Let's say I was to like super fully adopt this, uh, this lifestyle, right? Like, I really distrust the government. I don't want to use fiat currency. I don't want to use the, the paper dollar like ever in my life. And I'm just going to live like fully on crypto. Right. And I, I'm personally interested, you know, now that you're a little bit more involved in the, the Bitcoin community, have you met any people who are really, really diehard, like cypherpunks, like really sort of live in off the grid, a full like crypto enabled lifestyle? And if you know anyone like that, could you give us a little peek into what their life is like, you know, if they wanted to go like pay for coffee or something, just how different is it or how difficult is it to fully adopt this like no fiat full crypto lifestyle? Yeah, I, I do know uh, people who only live on fiat um, or not or don't use fiat, sorry, only use crypto. Um, and yeah, it, it does limit your options a little bit like obviously like more places accept us dollar than accept bitcoin that's a fact right um but the idea here is um yeah people like that do exist um the idea here is like you'd be like oh that's that's fucking crazy like why would like you us dollars works or like why would you first of all why would you spend your bitcoin <laughs> or like you should hodl it or whatever um but yeah, people do. I don't, I don't know how to, like, I don't know how to, like, I don't live, like, I don't personally live like that, but I do know people who do. Um, and yeah, they're kind of just like, this is how, this is like, I don't want to be tracked. I don't want anyone to see my transaction history. I don't want to use fiat. I don't want to be holding, like, like to them, like holding fiat assets is like more dangerous than holding Bitcoin um, because of how, uh, because of what it, like hinges upon it's like fiat hinges upon the government like promising you that you can like you know buy things with it um but it, like the way that i've kind of tried to explain it to people is like right now the bitcoin is better than us dollar any like fiat currency in some ways uh, not in the ways that we are typically used to thinking about technology in Silicon Valley. Like it's not faster, it's not cheaper, it's not easier to use, doesn't have like a sexy UI. Like those things are not really true, um, but it is better in more social ways that are, you know, less, less Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, it's more private, right? It's more accessible. It's, it doesn't rely on some government to benevolently maintain your currency for you. Um, you can host it, you can be your own bank by running your own node. Um, you can mine it yourself if you run mining nodes, um, not that you have to. But like, hopefully one day, and this is what developers hope is, is that Bitcoin will be better in all ways. But right now, if, the metric with which you use to measure what types of money you want to use is more centered around these social issues, then you choose Bitcoin. And that makes sense to you. And that's also like no issues. Like they're leaving, leading a, a more or less unhindered normal life. Yeah. So yeah. They, they live that's in refreshing to hear. You can like yeah. you can follow through on the full crypto vision. Yeah, yeah, they live in a first world country, they go to a coffee shop that, you know, uses BTC pay server or, you know, accepts Bitcoin or whatever. Um, and they pay, you know, they set up a lightning channel or something. They have a little wallet that they put on their keychain, and yeah, they like send it with their phone or something. They don't use Coinbase, they don't use like Kraken or whatever, they use like their own wallet. Um, yeah. Full on like that. And, and I'm interested in hearing, I mean, now that you've gotten to, to know some of these characters, you're investing yourself more into the Bitcoiner community and you've also like gotten some work under your belt on, on Bitcoin core. Um, I just like to know like what's, 
What do you feel like is, is next up for you in, in your career in Bitcoin right now? Is there maybe like a PR you're working on right now that, you know, we could understand if you explained it to us or a feature that, you know, the Bitcoiners are focused on in the near horizon? Where, where are your thoughts right now in the Bitcoin community and in your career? Yeah, I guess most of the Bitcoin community is thinking about Taproot. Um, it'll probably take a little bit, of, like maybe not in, well, I don't know when, how long it's going to take, but thinking about Taproot, I personally have like my biggest PR open right now. Do you really want to hear about it? <laughs> if you think um, we could understand it, I think we'd all love to hear like exactly what you're working on in Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I have a PR open right now that is centered around fees. So, um, so Bitcoin core includes the node, um, you know, which has validation code, um, which, you know, keeps a mempool of unconfirmed transactions, which stores, uh, blocks and all that stuff. Right. Um, and, and you can have it be mining or whatever, if you want to. Um, and then it also has a wallet. And it exposes a few different inter interfaces, so you can interact with your node via RPC, via REST, um, via command line. These are interfaces, right? That, that makes sense, right? Um, so we, we would call wallet and the interfaces like clients to the node. And then so you would be running your own node and then maybe use the core wallet through like a GUI on your like laptop or whatever, um, or, you know, you have something talk to it via RPC. Anyway, so the node right now has logic to prevent very, very high fees, um, absurd fees. Um, and so if you were to submit a transaction via the, the wallet that had like super, super high fees or via RPC, whatever, um, like more than like a thousand sats per V byte, um, then it would reject it for you. And that is baked into the validation code. However, when we are um, talking about code for the node itself, um, we don't want it to be client specific. So for example, right now, if I were to relay transact, like if my node were to receive a transaction from its peer that has an extremely high fee, it would be okay with that. It doesn't apply this logic on top of it. Um, but if it gets it from the client, then it'll care. And, and this is like within validation logic. And I don't think that makes very much sense. Like I, this is an opinionated PR where it extrapolates the logic for validation that includes these like absurd fee logic. And it instead redelegates it to the client. So like the RPC interface, for example. Um, and this means that the piece of code that handles validating transactions no longer gives a different response for transactions that it got from its peers versus from the wallet versus like the RPC interface. Um, it's not a behavior change, but like it's cleaner. Um, so that's one PR. And I just realized that I'm like saying a lot of things and like it's, it's probably very anticlimactic that that's what the PR does is it just moves things. Um, but it makes a cleaner interface for the node. No, I think that's great. I mean, also like, no offense, Gloria, you're, you're somewhat new to, to Bitcoin. I wouldn't expect you to be implementing like the most groundbreaking stuff, like, oh, let's shift it over to a completely new monetary policy. But I think that's great. You get to, I think, or at least the way you explained it to me, make it more secure, right? Like there is no longer this inconsistency in this global ready payment system that is Bitcoin. I think that's got massive impact. It was also really interesting to me to hear that you uh, you called it an opinionated PR, right? You you had an opinion, basically like a policy decision about Bitcoin that you felt should be made. You had the ability to go write the code for it and put it up. And what's so cool to me is that now you don't need just like your manager to go approve it and run it by the CTO or something. Does this you know behavior look good? You get the community to vote on it, right? Is that how the process works? Yeah, um, yeah, I can talk about that. So. Bitcoin is open source um, and it's openly hosted on GitHub. Anyone can make a PR. You don't have to apply, which is what I appreciate because I'm not very good at getting into things. 
Um, but yeah, anyone can make a PR. And then there are maintainers who have merge access. Um, but you know, typically before something is merged, you'll get two or three or more people who review the code. Um, and they'll say like, okay, this is a good idea. Or, um, so first of all, it's like, is this a good idea? And so, you know, my PR was opinionated and there were people who were like, I don't think this is a good idea. And then you kind of talk about it conceptually for a while. And then, you know, once the, you know, obviously if the idea makes sense, then people will look at the code and they'll be like, oh, maybe you should use a different data structure here or like maybe a different syntax or whatever. And then, you know, the, the comments get more and more granular towards the end. It's like, oh, maybe you can add a comment for something, right? So like, as it gets closer to being ready, the, the, the review is, is more granular. Um, and then what, after, you know, a couple of people have acted, you, usually like you, you would want to get review from someone who's an established contributor because they actually like know the code better. Like it's, it's like, this is people working on, working on Bitcoin core still. Right. So like, there's still a bit of like a social and political component there. Um, and then it gets merged. Um, and then there's a release. Uh, the release cycle is like on a six month basis. Um, so, you know, it, it, I, th I think it's the same in like most companies where you're you saying, like, okay, we're gonna do a release and then we're gonna have a feature freeze before then, um, make sure everything's stable. Like we'll have all the release notes and then um, it'll come with, that with, with a new release. And then that software is you know, published on bitcoincore.org and then people can download it. Not everyone updates, which is a fact. Um, and, you know, like Chrome will sometimes like force you to update by like not having your mic be broke, like it'll have your mic broken or, you know, it's, oh, you need to start Chrome because something's broken or like, you know, your phone's going to be like, oh, there's just, you know, like, I mean, usually there's like a security, like you should update your software on your phone and stuff. Um, but of course, like this is like Bitcoin is trying to be money and it's not okay if you're like, oh, sorry, you can't spend your money until like <laughs> you update your node, right? Um, so Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin developers very much believe in like, like we don't make non-backwards compatible updates. Um, I mean, there can be API breaking changes like there's a new protocol, a P2P protocol, like message, like that's okay. Um, but if there's a consensus change, for example, then we start talking about like soft fork compatibility, um, hard forks are not okay, stuff like that. But like every day, like code changes, like what I was talking about, where first of all, there's not really a behavior change. And second of all, it's like mostly implementation details, right? Like your node still behaves the same way. Like if one node up updates like their software and like the rest of the network doesn't, or, you know, there's like 50% update, 50% don't. There's still like nodes running like software from years ago. Like that needs to still be okay. Um, so it's like a very big deal when there's a consensus change like Taproot. And that's why I said, like, it's not because I don't believe in it. It's because like there's a lot of politics around that conversation. Yeah, such a complex process that, that it is to just update the code that is Bitcoin. Um, at this point, though, Gloria, unless there's a, there's something you'd want to maybe like dive into in depth, something that you want to talk about, I think it's a it's a good point to open this up to audience questions. Um, so mm -hmm. feel free to to drop them in the QA, um, and and we'll pick out some some winners and and give you Gloria's views. Also, I'll scroll through the chat right now. I noticed uh, it was being used. So while y'all are writing into the QA, I'll read off a couple from here. Oh, this is actually a very good question. Sorry, it's taking me a, a bit to get through it, but Kintaro asks, and I'm going to reduce a bit, so feel free to correct me in the chat, Kintaro, but essentially it seems that the question is this. Um, yeah, so like targeting is, is an issue when it comes to how our data is used, especially when we're, uh, you know, all over different social networks where there's so many like different data points that we put up. And sure, that's annoying. But uh, Kintaro raises the question, like, wouldn't anonymity in some branches of our life actually make sort of like, you know, the experience of 
of living more and knowing, right? So I think a, a, an example here is, for example, uh, you're, you're sending out resumes and you've got applications that you want to do everywhere. You could just have your data on LinkedIn and send out like the same application everywhere. But if mm -hmm. we're very privacy focused and we have like an anonymous or a pseudonymous account in, on whatever platform we use, um, doesn't that make it more annoying to, for example, send out a bunch of applications and I guess like, what are your views on the trade-off there on uh, privacy versus user experience? Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so there's, there's two ways I want to answer this question. So first of all, my TLDR is you're not going to be forced to make yourself anonymous, but LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, they don't give you the option of just being like, Hey man, like I, I want to opt out of this like data collecting thing. Like, that's not how it works. Um, like I think in the EU, they're like, oh, like it's your legal right to ask a company to delete all the data they have on you, but like you can't verify if that's true or not. And even if you've never made a Facebook in your life, Facebook still has a profile that they've built on, uh, on you um, based on like interactions they've seen with websites. So it's not about like, oh, everyone should do everything anonymously. It's, it's everyone should have the option of doing, doing things anonymously, not like, you know, like you, you can't opt out. And yeah, that's just the case. Um, and then the second thing is like, okay, like let's say the world is built like this and, and there are companies out there that are like, oh, let's like run ML on resumes to like better select applicants, right? Well, everyone's resume goes through like some kind of parser and like automated, uh, you know, screening process when you apply to like, you know, big companies like Google and stuff. And that's a normal part of the process. But then they're like, okay, why don't we train models to like better be able to pick out applicants? Um, and, and like ML is kind of based on data and like statistically, if you are a underprivileged group right now, if you suffer from stereotypes that are applied to you by humans, imagine how quickly an ML model learns that, you know, people of this race tend to be less educated or people of this tend to be like that, right? Like that you can't just like tell them, don't be racist, you know, like that's, that's right. Like, and, and like computer science and, and, and many of these things are very efficient at doing things like this. Um, and that coupled with you not being able to opt out of having to participate in a system like this, where everything is kind of like very efficiently churning out, you know, whatever uh, metric that this company is optimizing for, um, like you are, you are not free and you will continue, you will be, become less and less free. So yes, it is convenient for them to have more information about you to make it, a, make a decision, but you want to be able to opt out of that. Gotcha. So not necessarily uh, anonymity by default everywhere, but anonymity as an option by default. Yes. Exactly. I gotcha. Uh, there's another question here in the, in the Q and A section that, uh, that I, I also like, and I, I'm kind of interested in Stephen Bauer asks, are there any economists involved in the development of blockchain? Um, yeah, Gloria, do you know about this? Uh, maybe, I know Bitcoin's monetary policy is more or less set in stone, but in Bitcoin or in other projects that you know about, do you know if there's like economists actively interacting with the devs to, to set up the system? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of Bitcoiners that are economists and not devs. And there's a lot of, or like at least the devs that I talk to really try to think about economics and monetary policy as much as possible. And for me, that's usually the question that I have the hardest time answering because I'm not um, academically trained in economics. I'm ac ac academically trained in computer science. Um, there is a podcast, um, Stephen Lavera's podcast, where it, it's kind of a mix of technical and economic stuff. Um, you can read this book, um, The Bitcoin Standard, and, and there's many other books that are centered around evaluating Bitcoin as a money um, and not just like from an economics perspective, in addition to a technical or computer science perspective. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, and yeah, it's obviously we think about it. Um, and 
it's like, I don't know what the best money is. And I know there's many different attributes to it, including monetary policy. So I'm not going to stand here and like with no economic training whatsoever, tell you like, no, Bitcoin's perfect. Um, fuck off. You know, like, I'm not going to say that. Um, but yes, to answer your question. Yes. A lot of the Bitcoin community thinks about the economics. Yeah, that, that's really cool to me. I mean, I, I, I did know that like economics are very important to consider when you're creating like a whole, you know, a uh, platform on top of blockchain, if you want to incentivize your actors in any way. Um, but it, it's refreshing to me to hear that there's still a lot of like active economic interest in Bitcoin because it seems like it is for the most part set in stone how it behaves economically. Um, so it's cool to me to see that uh, we've still got bright minds on it. And should we realize that there are better possible models, we'll have the insight to implement them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, and this is kind of, maybe this is a cop-out answer, um, but like, for example, money based on the gold standard was not like, oh, there's a finite amount of gold, therefore we have no elasticity, right? Like all money works in kind of layers. You have like, like let's say gold is your base asset. You have money that's tied to gold. You can like extend credit that, you know, like it's, this is a promise to do this. And this is like a future on that. This is a derivative of that. Um, so I wouldn't say like, ah, what's in the code, which says we have the Bitcoin or have the mining reward every four years. That is the only like thing that we're going to consider when it comes to economics. Um, but yeah, and some people say this is like a cop out answer. So, but anyway, yeah, I think there was another question in the chat. Yeah, do you see any questions that uh, that stick out to you? I did a quick read through, if you want me to give you the synopsis. Uh, Let's see, blockchain immutability. Could a malevolent government use this to lie? I don't really understand the question. Yeah, Victor, I think um, if you're wondering about the specifics of immutability, oh, immutability doesn't imply perfect or truthful data, could have been malevolent. Um, so we'll definitely oh, like talk the, more detail mm -hmm. in lecture three about exactly how it is immutable and what, or well, immutable, uh, why we might call it that and, and what parts of the blockchain are tamper evident. But TLDR, uh, we try not to make any, any claims on if the data is truthful, just that it is in the state that it was inputted in. But we'll definitely talk a bit more about the implications there in lecture three and onwards. Yeah, um, I think I think Victor is talking about like the garbage in, garbage out kind of kind of thing. Um, I don't I don't think it's really relevant here. Yeah, I've got a okay. So Jack Ye here in the in the Q and A section has a question that um, you and I have sort of discussed in the past. Um, so he mentions that, for example, in web development, there are these like mass produced uh, products and platforms like Shopify or WordPress mm -hmm. uh, that are used by a lot of people and, and you know, uh, are very generalizable. But on the other hand, like there are on-premise solutions or more custom products that companies might want to use. Um, so and he asks, where, where do you see the blockchain space taking this? Is it going to be more of a, let's have like this one blockchain platform that everyone extends or will, be, will there be more like, so to speak, boutique blockchains that companies could adopt for themselves? And this reminds me a bit, I know we've talked about, you know, what is enterprise blockchain? Does that really make sense? And when Jack A mentioned like, uh, could there be, this sort of Shopify-esque blockchain platform that everyone uses. It made me think about uh, a lot of these enterprise blockchains that, that claim to be just that. And I think it'd be great to hear your thoughts on like, you know, enterprise blockchain, what's, what's the hype there, right? I think, I think it's a oxymoron uh, enterprise blockchain. I, it, I don't think it makes any sense. Um, I don't think there's anything to talk about. Um, like, like, uh, yeah, no, I don't. 
I, or like I can't think of an example of something where it makes sense. Um, I guess let us let us hear your thoughts a bit more for for those of us who are like still very new to blockchain or why is that such an oxymoron you know enterprise blockchain what what implications about how the blockchain is managed make that so like self contradictory yeah okay so um yeah I'm sorry if that sounded a little like dismissive or or like assholey um, essentially like we've talked a lot today about sovereignty and you know, not contributing to, but like having more control over the system that you buy into or not buying into a system at all. And from what I've seen, I think a lot of times what we tend to call enterprise blockchain kind of like takes this piece of like, you know, some aspect of Bitcoin or blockchain as they call it and they like insert it into their business model and they say like ah because we're using this data structure or this piece of technology we have the same social guarantees as bitcoin which uses the same technology right so for example the blockchain data structure is like the best example of this and this will touch on what victor said as well in that they're saying like ah because bitcoin uses a blockchain um which is like a block, like blocks of data with hash pointers to their previous block. If we use that, we can also call our thing trustless and immutable. And that's, that's not how technology works. Or like, I guess in some cases it does where it's like, ah, all we have to do is take this machine learning model, which has, you know, slightly better, smarter, whatever. And if we like plug and play it into our current business model, we can make decisions faster or better. And that is the case sometimes. Um, but the whole idea, like the whole cypherpunk idea and the whole block, uh, blockchain idea as I define it is not like, ah, this data structure or ah, this algorithm. Um, so for example, like Bitcoin runs a distributed system of nodes and they communicate peer to peer. Um, and that's part of the censorship resistance and like, you know, ah, Byzantine fault tolerance, all of those things. Like we use a lot of uh, buzzwords to talk about the security guarantees or whatever it is. And the security model there is like, everyone is your enemy uh, or everyone is your, like you can have up to 49% of the network be malicious in some way, right? But then enterprise uh, companies, when they like create this blockchain project, and I'm not trying to make a blanket statement, but a lot of times, I've had clients ask me, they're like, ah, so like if we want Byzantine fault tolerance in our private blockchain, how many nodes do we need to run? Technically four. Um, and it's like, okay, so we'll have our cloud servers, which are, you know, in our own warehouses, nobody else gets, like, we are the only ones running a node. We're going to run four of them. And we're going to have one in the US, one in Asia, one in Australia, one in Europe, and that's distributed that's decentralized and we're going to say this is Byzantine fault tolerant or whatever. And like, like it's not comparable, you know, it's a different, like from, from like an, an intellectual standpoint, the security model is completely different because your, your, your peer set is static. You're, you're not <laughs> allowing people to like enter the network right and, and there's more nuanced versions of this as well where they're going to say like okay we have static peers um if you want to run a node all you have to do is send our foundation your uh, uh oh i'm i don't want to talk about specifics but like you, you just need to send our, the found like send us an email with like your your public key or i mean your public address and then we'll add you to the validators list and then like you know and then you've joined and that's like accessible because all you have to do is email us, right? But but still, you know. And then they're like, oh, you know, we we th that one's a little bit more accessible. Like it's more like towards the middle of the spectrum than like the enterprise one was. But that's still a completely different adversarial model, right? Like you're like they they you, they have your email address first of all, right? But in Bitcoin, it's anyone can join. Peers are dynamic. Um, you can run as many nodes as you want. It's not tied to whatever, right? Um, so that's what I mean when I say like, there's not much to talk about. 
because if you're going to like remove all of these like security assumptions like it's not interesting anymore it's not like it's not blockchains it's not cypherpunk it's it's like you're just plugging and like you're just like taking out this little piece of like this little piece that you like and you're like inserting it and you're pretending like you're doing blockchain stuff yeah yeah i'm with you Spay, like there's not really much point in, in enterprise blockchain because again depending on how it's implemented but if it is like access controlled by the enterprise it pretty much like why use a blockchain jack i know that didn't quite answer your question but i i it just i know gloria's got some some good some good thoughts on enterprise blockchain how to describe it uh so i felt we might as well go into that and i think we might as well finish off with uh these last couple questions that i'm seeing in the chat here um so kintaro is asking again um basically what's what's the trade-off between the uh you know, the security allowances that Bitcoin gives us versus the inefficiency, right? So he says, so, should, uh, so Bitcoin in a way should be a complementary choice of living to uh, the model-based data collection that recent technologies like ML are bringing to life. How do you think we could reap the benefits of efficient behavior via data while keeping anonymity via technologies like blockchains? Like how do we reap the benefits of these incredible data models that uh, we've been able to construct uh, in tandem with the benefits of blockchain, the anonymity that it may provide. Kintar asks, like, is it a choice between the two? Are there hybrids we could build? Uh, this sort of makes me think of like L2 solutions um, and uh, integrations with like other platforms. If there's anything that comes to mind on that that you'd want to talk about. Yeah, uh, that's it's a very like big question. Um, I think if I can like turn it into a more concrete question and Kintaro can say if this is like a question that he's he's interested in me answering is like for example we have the tools ne necessary to take for example healthcare data into extremely valuable um, data driven treatment options in healthcare. So for example, like I used to work at Cars of Permanente where they've been around for like 150 years. They have like millions of patients and like lifetime healthcare record data about them. And if you were to be able to say like, oh, that's, that's really freaking valuable to be able to like, you know, run it through some artificial intelligence thing and be able to diagnose things faster or like come up with more individualized treatment programs based on like, okay, we've had like a thousand cases with, you know, this type of profile and then we can make a better, just like, right. These are, this is like a guaranteed win in terms of if we're able to apply this in a healthcare situation. However, and, and this is where the healthcare industry is great in that by default, um, if you've heard of HIPAA, like basically no healthcare company is allowed to do anything with your like they have to keep it confidential all of your healthcare records need to be so then we would like to have both in that we want to keep healthcare records anonymous uh or you know we don't want to that's literally a law that cannot be broken um but also it would be really nice if we were to be able to like say to kaiser like hey man like give us all this data and then we'll solve cancer i'm just kid kidding but like you know something like that right so Kentaro, is that okay? Like a more concrete way of answering that question, right? Um, and this is where kind of the, ah, okay, he said, yeah, okay. So this is kind of where like the extent of my technolo technological knowledge and like my ability to predict the future is, is limited. Um, we would like to do I know Dave is here, so he's going to laugh at me. Um, we would like to do con confidential computing or like de-anonymized data, uh, healthcare data, and then run models on it. Or we would like to have some kind of like, this is where the interdisciplinary like uh, legal processes as well as like what we're able to achieve as like privacy engineers or like cryptographers, um, where we can like come to some kind of agreement where either it runs in some confidential computing platform like Oasis, or if we have some kind of like process that is legal where someone can opt in and say like, oh, I'm a Kaiser, you know, like 
member and Kaiser asked me like, would you be okay with us utilizing this data in an anonymized fashion, as in like removing all identifying information from it. And you know, you get a discount or like, you know, you, you pay for, or you are paid for the rights to compute on your data in an anonymized way. And hopefully that process is verifiable. That's the pro that's the problem that I see is like, sure. Like if Kaiser approached me today and I was like, ah, oh, as a Kaiser member, like we're running this pilot program where like, we're, you know, we have a, a deal with like IBM cloud and, you know, they have these confidential, or I think Azure has this where they have like confidential, they, they run like TEEs or SGXs and you can like confidential compute and, and we're going to do this. Right. I would say no, because like, Kaiser is basically asking me to trust them, to, you know, like, right. It, 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 of course, Kaiser already has my data, blah, blah, blah. But like, as someone who's coming from like a blockchain slash like cypherpunk like perspective, the key point here is I want to be able to verify that my data is being computed on anonymously, not trust that some lawyer like, you know, got the contracts right. And, you know, and all that stuff. So we're working on it. That's, that's a huge Yeah, goal. it's a good vision, right? It's, it's a good idea. Um, and, and it's not mutually exclusive, no. The idea of being able to use data and, you know, being able to choose whether or not your data is being used. They're not mutually exclusive. And I guess, uh, well, I think we've got time for about one more question. So Gloria, unless uh, one of these last three questions really sticks out to you, uh, I think uh, Nish from, from Bab uh, has a pretty good question. I've left him waiting in this section. Uh, he's asking, you know, what, what do you pick out of the, the DeFi hype that's been going on recently? Um, maybe particularly how DeFi relates to Bitcoin, if there's any interplay there. But yeah, what, what do you pick out of the hype? Um, I haven't been following DeFi so much. Um, well, I guess even if you don't know any specific projects, which like, I don't blame you for, uh, do you think, like, what do you think is going to remain from, from DeFi as a movement? Do you think we're going to like completely re-architect the world's financial system? Mm -hmm. Like all investment banks are going to go crypto first because they, they get the value proper. Uh, how far do you think the, the trend is, is going to carry? Mm, that's a good question. Mm, I think it, well, like everything else, it, I think DeFi has, has received because it, you know, there's a lot of money in it. It, it gets a lot of hype attention. And so like a lot of it is not that legitimate. But I think the fact that we're able to build these financial instruments and create derivatives and trade them and, um, you know, provide the foundation for liquidity and, you know, for all of these actors to, you know, this, the fact that it works, uh, that we can have, like, finance beyond just, I send money to you, you send money to me. Um, is a really fundamental like building block on which more complex applications can be built. Um, like these are, they're, you know, finance is a very base layer thing. Um, and so like, you know, again, I don't have formal training in economics or finance, um, but I think that's, that's what I would make of it is that this enriches the ecosystem and that it allows you to do more with crypto very similarly to how you can do a lot of things with fiat um and it would it, it'll pave the way for more things or whatever um yeah hopefully that is a satisfactory answer yeah i mean what i get from that is that it's very likely to stay it seems that it's not just about the icos and the yield farming and like all the all like the degenerate coins like at the bottom of it there are like fundamentally important instruments that can be translated like across the blockchain ecosystem yeah we want liquidity we want to be able to 
pay for things. It removes some friction um, in mm. using crypto for various applications. Um, but like, don't don't go being like, oh, DeFi is like hella legit. Everything that has DeFi on it is now hereby like worth my attention. Um, there's a lot of noise, and you should still be very selective about what you look at. Definitely a lot of noise. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, we're we're just about on time there, and uh, I know we've got a couple of questions left, but I don't really want to hold you over, Gloria. So I think it's a good place to call it. Personally, I've had a great time chatting with you. I mean, obviously, we I've, I've had the pleasure of having such a conversation with you before, but I think it was great to get to get to share the the love a bit and, and show our participants what our previous uh, president is all about. Yeah, it's always it's always good to talk to you, Andrew. Um, Thank you so much for inviting me to do this with you. Um, I can't actually see the questions, but yeah, if anyone wants to like, if you're like a babby, you can always message me on Slack and stuff, so. Yeah, oh, oh one last thing I'll do, I'll do for our, our gracious guest here. Gloria, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's gzal408. Um, yeah, you can follow me if you want, um, but more I would advise that you follow the people that I follow um, if you're interested in seeing some good Bitcoin stuff. Some you guys should definitely follow me. I get all of like my Bitcoin community news from her because the rest of my Twitter is just DeFi degeneracy. But yeah, <laughs> she knows the good content creators to follow. Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but uh, with that, I, I think we're we're good to call it there. I wonder if I can stop the recording. I don't think I'm actually allowed to. Um, but in any Probably case, am. you guys can can trickle off uh, at your at your own leisure. And if there are, actually, I, I mean, might as well take the the remaining time to just answer these questions. Um, so, thank you, Stephen Bauer. Oh yeah. This is a, a pretty good one. So, so Victor Way is asking just like a, a kind of for fun one. Um, so apparently Vitalik Buterin was quoted to say that he sees three uh, outcomes for blockchain. And so in a computer languages analogy or just languages in general. So it could either sort of take the route of Esperanto, uh, which is like a very niche international language. Uh, so like just used in very, very small areas. Or it could go like the Linux way, where very foundational, you know, very core, a lot of things are built on top of this, but still sort of hidden, right? Blockchain isn't a, a top layer that we develop upon. Or it could be like the internet. So like incredibly widespread, definitely the platform that everyone is building on right now. And like the abstraction layers are significantly higher than that of Linux, but it's still like, it is the base, right? So where do you think it goes? Like very niche, um, implicitly used everywhere or the go-to platform to build upon? Blockchain? Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is where I think like my definition of blockchain kind of is very different from other people's in that um, like there isn't like the one blockchain that can be like the be all end all platform or whatever. Um, and like Bitcoin's been forked many times. So I guess maybe that could be like an analogy to Linux. Um, but fundamentally, like if someone managed to delete the entire internet today, um, people like you and I would not, would not forget that, that this is what happened. It's like, it's an idea, right? It's, it's the idea of, I don't need, or like the idea of this technology exists and I don't have to just buy into whatever like company application is fed to me as a consumer. Um, like the cryptography can be used to, to um, preserve our privacy just as it can be used to secure things or whatever. Um, so like if everything was deleted now 
we would go back to like I would go back to implementing whatever like whatever technology kind of like aligns with these ideals that I have or th these ideas um, and uh, the implementation not be ex might not be exactly the same um, might be completely different might be completely re-architected um, and not all blockchain companies look the same either um, so I mean, I don't know if this is like a wishy-washy cop-out answer, but. I mean, it sounds like, to me like from those three choices, if anything, it's akin to the internet because it seems like that of those choices is the most also ideologically motivated, just like open global communication is the point of the internet. And it's like the internet, what really is it? Right? I mean, like, I know we've got IP basically, but even like the common protocols that we use on it aren't tied to it. Like HTTP is not the internet, right? It seems mm -hmm. to me like when you were talking about should blockchain go down, like I would just start rebuilding it from a principles first standpoint. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems to me like that's the same thing that, uh, you know, the founders or not the founders, but those who had originally developed the internet would do too. Like, even if it's not HTTP that we end up recreating in the end, the point is like, open global communication whereas for you right the point is uh you know security and, and verifiable operations via cryptography you know properly incentivize actors in a stable system via like the economics so going back to principles first makes it seem like of those three options it's if anything it's most akin to the internet yeah 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 <laughs> cool well, yeah. Well, again, thanks for coming by. Everyone who's, uh, who stuck around this long, thank you as well. I'll drop um, one final link to our, our Facebook group because uh, if you guys aren't already on it, you should definitely join. This is where we're going to have all discussion for the course. Um, Why is it a Facebook group? It's a Facebook group? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That should rub you the wrong way. It's a Facebook Well, group. I don't have Facebook. <laughs> oh. It's okay. I'll, I'll post... I'll post for you. Um, Why don't you do like Piazza or something? Yeah, we didn't have access to Piazza. And the other thing we were considering was Slack, but uh, we actually, we were really hoping to keep everyone involved with the other events and things that Bab would be doing. And this would mm -hmm. also give you a way to uh, connect with the members. Um, and so you'll be able to see what we're up to because we're definitely going to keep, be keeping everyone in the loop on blockchain uh, at Berkeley in general via our Facebook. Cool. Cool. Yeah. When's, when's lecture three? That's my favorite lecture. Lecture three?